Hi everyone, um, thank you for attending today's webinar. Uh, my name is Laura and I'd like to welcome you back to McGraw-Hill Professionals Business Insider Work Smarter webinar series. We're here to help you work smarter and our authors will provide you with the practical and essential skills you need to succeed in professional lives. In today's webinar, Joe Paluzzi and Jason Miles have teamed up to deliver strategies to leverage content marketing and social media to get and engage more customers. Let me introduce the authors and we'll get started with this webinar. Joe Paluzzi is a content marketing strategist, a professional speaker, and the founder of Content Marketing Institute, which runs the largest physical content marketing event in North America, Content Marketing World. Founder of three marketing services entities, he has worked with hundreds of brands, including dozens of Fortune 1000 companies. Joe is the author of Get Content, Get Customers, and the newly published book, Epic Content Marketing. Jason Miles is the co-founder and marketer at Liberty Jane Clothing. He is also the Vice President for Advancement, Marketing Development and Human Resources at Northwestern University, where he is responsible for the enrollment marketing as well as branding, alumni re relations, and fundraising. Jason is the author of a series of visual marketing and social media books, Pinterest Power, Instagram Power, and YouTube Power. If you'd like to learn more about Joe and Jason, their books are available in print and ebook everywhere books are sold. We have two great authors presenting today, and you can go to bit.ly slash mhpworksmarter for the complete webinar series schedule. Don't forget to tweet the event at mhbusiness, at Joe Paluzzi, and at Mr. Jason Miles using hashtag worksmarter. Now I'll turn it over to Joe to begin. All right. Laura, thank you so much. Uh, I hope everyone can hear me. This is my first time on this platform, so I'm ready to get to, it's, it's interesting seeing everybody's faces out there. So, And shame on you for, the, for those of you not showing your faces. Um, thanks to McGraw-Hill Professional. Uh, thanks to uh, Shindig, and thanks to uh, Jason for hanging out with me today. We're going to have a little bit of fun. So format today, I'm going to do about 15 to 17 minutes or so. I'm going to go over two specific things related to content marketing. And then we're going to have Jason talk for about 15 to 17 minutes. And then the two of us are going to get on screen at the same time. And we're going to talk a little bit about uh, answer any questions you might have and talk about you know visual storytelling and the stuff that Jason's working on as well as what I'm working on. So, Laura, you can go ahead and uh, switch to the next slide. And uh, actually, Laura, you, you just kind of went through what we do at Content Marketing Institute. We're probably best known for two things. One is, as Laura said, Content Marketing World which is our big show. We had over 1,700 marketers from 46 different countries went into Cleveland last year. It's going to be in Cleveland again next year. Hope to see you there. And then if you're not subscribed to Chief Content Officer Magazine, make sure you do. Uh, it's now, it's every other month we produce uh, Chief Content Officer Magazine. goes to 22,000 uh, marketing professionals from all, all over the world, but mostly in North America. All right, switch it on or we'll get rolling here. So I'm going to just set a little bit of the stage with some of the research. This is our fourth year Content Marketing Institute and Marketing Props. I've been doing this research for the past four years. And if you can see that short link, all of it's ungated and available. So if you want to go to that bit.ly.com link slash CM dash research, you can get all of our, we just released nonprofit. We've got B2B, B2C, and all, the, all that good stuff sort of benchmarking the industry. Uh, the interesting findings this year, uh, basically 93% of the marketers that we took anywhere in all the studies we've earned right around the 90 percent mark so nine in ten marketers are using content marketing to attract and retain customers in some way so they are creating original content to attract customers so really we all are publishers today like it or not i'm not really sure what the seven percent are doing but we'll talk about them later okay switch to the next slide laura so here's so look at those numbers right so nine out of ten are using content marketing but just 42 percent believe their content marketing is effective i mean if you're you know david ortiz and you're batting 420 that's fantastic but if you're a marketer today and you're only seeing 42 percent effectiveness we've got a problem you go ahead to the next slide laura the biggest issue and what we asked this year uh was how many of you have a documented content marketing strategy so this is what, you know, I sort of uh, cried a little tear here when we're looking at the research. So I like the fact that everybody's using content marketing. Fantastic, right? Uh, but less than 50%. Of all. 
So we want to figure out why we're not seeing effectiveness. It's because of the fact that those people that are not showing effectiveness in some way, they do not start with the strategy. They do what we call fill in buckets, and I'll talk about that in a second. Go ahead to the next slide, Laura. We're, we're ba we've got all these channels that we're filling in. Um, so, okay, we need, you know, Jason's going to talk a lot about Instagram and Pinterest. It's like, oh, what are we going to do on those channels? And what are we going to do on our blog and our website and Facebook and, and e-newsletters and webinars and publishing all these things? Actually, a side stat, which I think is interesting, the average company, uh, average large company has 17 different they post every year. That could be print, that could be in person, that could be online. That's a lot. And it's actually more than most media companies. So we're so brands are actually producing more than most media companies. And and there's an issue, and I call this this issue that we have here. We're creating all this content, but in a lot of cases we don't know why we're doing it. And I don't say why. Like I don't understand we want we have a business objective behind it, but we don't understand what the audience's why is. And I, what I'd like to talk about here first, I'm going to talk about two things. One is how you can create your own content marketing mission statement. And the second one we're going to talk about is how to grow an audience using an influencer. So Laura, go on to the next one. So I'm going to show you a couple of examples here of content marketing mission statements. And then we're going to go on and we're going to try to create one ourselves and get this thing done. So the first one, if you're, not, if you're looking at this one, this is homemadesimple.com. I don't know if you're familiar with this site. This is produced by Procter & Gamble. It was created in 2003, and they have well over 10 million people subscribed to get regular content from this site about recipes, about organizational tips for the home. I mean, how would you like that? Basically, you have 10 million people raise their hand and say, yes, I would like to receive your marketing messages. That's exactly what this is. The first and foremost, they have a mission statement behind this, just the same as a publishing company would have an editorial mission behind any content brands that they would put out into the marketplace. So go ahead to the next slide, Laura, and we'll go over that mission statement. So here is their content marketing mission statement, enabling women to have more quality time with their families. Let's look at this and why this is so important. You, whether you're a small business, whether you are a large marketer at a large business, doesn't matter. You have many people for the most part creating content. That could be employees, that could be freelancers, stringers, agencies, whatever the case is. I've seen so many times where basically somebody's going to create content and you give somebody a keyword string and say, go create content without them really understanding what the goal of the entire content project is. So in this case, we're talking about enabling women to have more quality time with their families. What won't you find as part of this content? You won't find six hour recipes here because it doesn't go to the mission of the overall project. So what I, what I want you to do is, and we'll do this in a second, but as you create your content marketing mission statement, we want to take this and get this in front of every one of the people that create content so they have a context as to why they're creating this content and information in the first place instead of just doing it on some more, more widgets, more products, more services. Because what we've got to make, why we're doing a mission statement in the first place, even though everyone's creating content out there, if it's not interesting, if it doesn't have impact, if it's not entertaining in some way, it's going to be ignored. So your customers don't care about you, your products, or your services. They care about themselves. So we want to create a start with a strategy, start with this mission statement to make sure we get everybody on the same page. Go ahead to the next slide. So that was a B2C one. Here's a B2B one. And I love this example. This is from Indium Corporation. They manufacture industrial solder, so you can't get much more B2B than this. What I love about this, there's 17 engineers that blog on on a regular basis about answering questions around solders. So go to the next slide and we'll talk about the, the mission statement of this one. Rick Short, who's the director of marketing for Indium, actually launched this program and, when, and within 12 months saw a 600% increase in qualified leads because I think the fact that they were really understanding what their audience's needs were and they were creating content that, that fit those, uh, that solved their pain points. So if you look at, here's their content marketing mission statement, helping engineers answer the most challenging industrial solder questions. We're not, you know, we're not talking to CEOs, we're not talking to CFOs, we're talking to engineers, we're not talking to plant managers, right? very, very different audience. So we're focused on the engineer as the audience. Okay, who, what, what kind of information are we creating? We're not talking about ball bearings, we're not talking about siding, we're talking about answering the most challenging industrial solder questions. 
you can do this as a B2B company and really become the leading informational expert, but you have to set the strategy to do that. And that's what Indium was able to do. So I want you to think about doing this for your own organization. Let's go to the next slide and go over it. So actually, just to bring this around and then we'll go over it. If you look at, I mean, look at the stuff that you're doing, right? You want content for search, you're trying to drive online leads, and you're trying to be interesting in social media. So those are the legs of the stool. The first thing you have to do is start with your big why. Why is this important to your audience? And then next, what is your overall objective? Is it to drive sales in some way? Is it to save costs in some way? Or is it to create happier customers? Your content marketing objectives have to be around those three things, and then they have to mesh with something that's relevant and interesting to your customers. So just think about that for a second. Go on to the next slide, Laura. So we're going to create our content marketing mission statement. Let's just move on because I want to make sure we have enough time for, for Jason and his awesome stuff too. Go to the next slide, Laura, and we'll go over this example here. Okay, so I'm going to use an example from Inc. If you're familiar with Inc., one of my favorites. I get giddy when it comes in the mail. I love to look at it. Go to the next slide, Laura, and we'll go over. I want to break down Inc.'s editorial mission statement, but this would be your content marketing mission statement. So let's look at this. This, you can find this on their About Us page. Welcome to Inc.com, a place where entrepreneurs and business owners can find useful information, advice, insights, resources, and inspiration for running and growing their business. Next slide, Laura, and we'll go through the three parts. Here's the three parts that you have to create. What we know is that most of you out there, you're probably creating a lot of content already, but you might not have a strategy behind it. I want you to get that strategy. Here's where you start. The first thing is your core audience. Really think about this. You're going to have multiple content marketing strategies because you have multiple audiences. If you're talking to a CEO versus a CFO versus an engineer versus a, a mom at home or a dad at home, whatever, those are very different audiences and you have different content marketing strategies. That's why this is so hard. If you want easy, we've got to look at advertising. If you, want comp if you want hard and complex, you can look at publishing. You could look at content marketing. But So we're going to need to do three things with our audience. One is, who's your core target? Two is, what are you going to be delivered? Let's look at Inc.'s example. Who's their target? They feel entrepreneurs and business owners are similar enough to put those into the same bucket. What to deliver? Useful information, most important thing. Really useful information. And then number three is what is the outcome? And this is the most important one. So every piece of content that you create for your customers, you have to figure out what the outcome is for the customer. In this case, it's about being more profitable or growing your business. That's If you read every piece of Inc. content, that is the outcome. If I'm reading it, I'm like, they're trying to help me grow my company or be more profitable. That's it. So when you create your content, whatever that might be, it might be a blog post, it might be a webinar, you have to understand what that outcome is because we've got to, that content's got to be good. We're competing with everything, folks. It's the best of breed content. So we've got to focus on that. So that's the content marketing mission statement. I want, I don't care, this doesn't have to be six pages, folks. It could be on a cocktail napkin for all I care, but really put it together and get these three things going, and this can be the start of your content marketing strategy. Okay, go to the next slide, Laura. All right, so this is the last thing I'm going to talk about, and then I'm going to kick it over to Jason for his commentary. I'm going to talk about building audience. And I can, boy, if I had a lot of time, maybe we'll get to it through the Q&A. I see it so often where people, brands, small businesses and large businesses are creating all this content, but they don't have an audience built yet. So there's no use in creating content, right? We have to build an audience. It's our whole goal to have our audience. We're trying to create brand subscribers to our brand. We're trying to uh, create an attachment with our customers because of the content that we, so this loyalty and retention and some kind of emotional connection. That's what we're trying to do. So we're going to do this to so talk a little bit about using what I call a social influencer model to build that audience and integrate those influencers into your content. So go to the next slide, Laura, and we're going to go through it. Okay, so what we call this is the social media 411 plan. And I have to give a big shout out to my good friend, author of the book, Brandscaping, Davis. He came up with this. I totally stole it from him, but I'm going to share with you kind of my take on the social media 411 plan. Go to the next slide, Laura. We'll go through it. Okay. So I don't know if you can see this or not, but it really doesn't matter. The point is, is that if you're going to make a social influencer plan work for you, you have to first start out with a list of influencers. So first thing is, what is an influencer? An influencer, these are where your customers are hanging out when they're not on your site. And you can make an easy list of this. You could use Google Alerts. You could use Twitter hashtags. You could look on Twitter. 
You could use fancy reputation management systems. It doesn't matter. But you have to start with some list, and I would say start with five. And this could be bloggers. This could be associations. Uh, it could be other media companies. It could be actually competitors. You don't know who it is. So create that list. So that's the first thing. And what you're looking at here, this is our partial list of our um, influencer list that we put together. And our goal is to create relationships with these people. So go to the next slide, Laura, and I'll show you how to do this. So what we want to do is we want to create relationships with these influencers so ultimately they will share our messaging and get that out to their audience because their audience is who you want your audience to be, right? It's where your customers are hanging out when they're not on your site. So you got to first get that list. And then, so think about this from a social media distribution standpoint. And I know Jason's going to talk about some great visual storytelling. You could think about it that way. I'm going to use Twitter as the example here. So four plus one plus one. So for every, let's say, six tweets in Twitter, and you can use whatever your social platform is. Uh, it could be LinkedIn, it could be Facebook, whatever the case is. But in this case, so for every six tweets, we want to do the 411 methodology here. So let's look, go, take it from the right side. First is sales. So for every six tweets, one of those can be about your, some product you have, some sales. A lot of us have product marketing people going down our throat. We need to make sure we have uh, that kind of information for them. Put that in. It's not going to be shared very often to get the product marketing people off your back. So that's the one. The one in the middle, that's your content marketing. That's your educational blog post. That's your webinar. That's your white paper. That's your really good, good information. And the four is that's influencer posts. And what you have to do is, so that's of every six, you're sharing other people's content. 67% of the time, it's other people's content. And we're sharing that out there. And we're not asking for anything. We're giving and giving and giving to those influencers and you're going to take, do this for months, and you're going to get on their radar. Go to the next slide, Laura, and I'll, and I'll take this through. Give you an example. Con we ran this content marketing playbook. We did it first in 2000. So we had our influencer list. Then we're going to take it to this playbook. And what we want to do is we want to insert this in their influencer content into our content. Because what we want to do is we want them to share it. So we're first, we're pinging them using this 411 methodology. Then we're putting their content in the playbook. And actually, we put like things like, uh, so Jay Bear was our number one influencer on our list. So I'd say, okay, uh, check on page nine, I'd say, check out this great blog post from Jay Bear, put the link in, or I would insert a case study from one of the influencers in there. And all I did was let them know. And we did this for 26 of those influencers, and we put it in the playbook. You want to know how many of those 26 influencers shared that content? 24 of them. And we got 50,000 downloads, and it was shared all over the place in a very short period of time, not because of audience, because we didn't have an audience. It was because of their audience sharing it. They'd come back to our site, and then we could get that audience and then also get them to subscribe to other things and keep that audience going. Go to the next slide, Laura. And then I'll end with this because I want to make sure we get on to Jason and, and then get to Q&A. And then you have to make sure that you have something at, at your site to get subscribers. So our goal of our blog site is to get email subscribers, get and keep an email subscriber. Go to the next slide, Laura. So for our own content, we put the information, we're tweeting that when people go ahead and they come back to our site, we want to capture that information. I know nobody's a big fan of pop popovers on here or pop-ups. As a user, I'm not, but as a content marketer, I am. So it's about 55 to 60% of our signups come from this type of a popover form. By the way, this is Pippity that we use on this one. Um, so look at something like that. Go to the next slide, Laura. And then we also use SlideShare. And I know and then it's good, actually a good handoff to Jason here in a second because this is the whole visual part of it. We use SlideShare as a really cool tool. And if you go to the next slide, Laura, I'll show you this. So SlideShare, if you're not using like the YouTube for PowerPoint presentations, we put a lot of content on there. And you can, through a SlideShare Pro subscription, you can sign up here and you can get people to sign up, subscribe for more information on your site if they download it, or you could do a little popover like you see there. Either one, you have to have a pro subscription to do it. You can have a free subscription just to use SlideShare, though. So when we want send out our content, we wanted to come back to our site, and we actually would like to get an ongoing relationship with that customer. We've got to do that. We've got to get their information in some way to create that platform so that it is an own media property. And go ahead to the next slide, Laura. And I think that's it. That's it for me. I don't have to put my there now. I know I'm at Joe Pulitzer. I know some people are tweeting. I'm going to pass it off to Jason now. Jason, you take it home, and then we'll come back for the Q&A.
Can you guys hear me now? Hope so. Uh, let me know. Um, it's an honor. Thanks so much for allowing me to present. Um, and this actually will dovetail together perfectly with what Joe was just talking about. So let me share just a tiny bit about our uh, small business and a little bit about me, and then we'll jump right into a focus on Instagram. Uh, so living is the small business. My wife and I started around our kitchen table in 2008. And uh, my day job is actually as Senior Vice President for Advancement at a university in the Seattle area, Northwest University. Uh, but this next year I'm going full time with online marketing and with Liberty Jane Clothing, so I'm excited about that. So when we started Liberty Jane Clothing, you can go to the next slide, we didn't have any money at all. Uh, and uh, we needed to decide how to market our, our uh, unique products. And uh, feel free to look us up on, on any of the uh, social platforms. We actually started on YouTube. Uh, by doing design contests and um, got some traction there. Um, today we have about 11,700 subscribers, over a million video views on YouTube. Um, and then Facebook came along uh, and we jumped into the Facebook uh, you know, space and started to learn how to use it. Um, along the way we figured out that email marketing was the most important probably tool that you can put together as a small business startup. And uh, then in 2011 Pinterest came along for us and totally blew up our business in terms of traffic. Uh, we didn't know what it was, but we, we started to look into it. Um, and uh, when that began to happen, I began to blog about it publicly. And uh, a couple weeks later, got the, the opportunity to jump into a book project. And it was uh, a, just a real honor. So Pinterest Power came out uh, last year. And uh, you can go on to the next slide, uh, Laura. And I'll rattle through these pretty quick here. So then um, I was all about Pinterest, and uh, I said to one of my buddies, um, hey, Pinterest is really working for us, and here's how it's working. And he said, you know, Instagram is working better for me uh, for engagement, and that was fascinating to me. So I started to look at how he was using Instagram. You can go to the next slide. And uh, then we were at a conference uh, uh, together with Chris. He was starting to talk about the shift toward uh, visual content and it really clicked with me that uh, Instagram was following along in that pattern of this social shift towards uh, visual content and and I wanted to start I started to get interested in Instagram I wanted to learn how to do it because um, it was the first social network from my view that really scaled largely on the mobile platform it was born mobile I call it in the book and it really became um, socially adopted completely in the mobile space and that's fascinating and you'll pr you've probably seen the user statistics as it relates to people's shift towards uh, consumption of content and social engagement and so Instagram is right in that sweet spot of both being about visual content and also sort of representing this shift towards uh, the mobile experience um, and uh, so go ahead to the next slide so the other reason I wanted to learn how to use it was because uh, uh, the user adoption was just scaling tremendously uh, quickly. Instagram recently announced that there are over 150 million monthly active users. Uh, just as a frame of reference, you know, Twitter just went public and their uh, documents said that in 2012 they had about 132 million monthly active users. Um, so Instagram in just a couple exploded onto the scene. Um, and really, if you talk to you know, my kids, a 16-year-old, a 15-year-old, um, and a 12-year-old, and ask them what they're doing on their phone, they'll say, Instagram, instant messaging with one of their friends, uh, or Candy Crush. Uh, Facebook's not there, Twitter's not there. They're pretty focused on the platforms that they operate on. Um, and uh, so it was fascinating to me. Um, go ahead to the next slide. So of course we started with zero on Instagram like everybody else, and you can check out our business profile uh, at Liberty Jane Clothing. Um, and now we have about uh, 4,000 followers on the um, we started on September 17th of last year and uh, we have uh, just under 200 uh, posts um, so my real question in uh, in getting an Instagram first of all was what was my what you might call editorial mission and I think that's just a little bit different terminology than Joe might use but it's actually a very similar idea which is to to ask that question why are you using it and in what value are you going to add for your fans and followers and customers through that platform. So for us at Liberty Jane Clothing, we decided we were gonna add value by giving them a behind the scenes look at our design process 
and sort of the the business um, reality for my wife as a designer, and we have two other designers, and we have 20 seamstresses that sew for us. Um, so that was the object or the goal for our content strategy as we started on Instagram. But then I had the opportunity to um, to write the book Instagram Power, and I really started to explore what other small businesses were doing uh, with with Instagram and how they were using it for direct marketing. So go ahead to the next slide. Um, what I quickly noticed was that there were, you know, 10 or so uh, specific elements on Instagram that you can use for presentation of your content. And none of them are a silver bullet. Um, but when you weave them together as a content marketer, um, you can actually present yourself uh, fairly robustly. Uh, so let me just run through these real quickly. Obviously, you've got the product um, name, brand, and any imagery that you put on the image. So you can see in this example, it's probably hard to see, but this is uh, one of the uh, options that we did. It's a doll outfit. Um, and uh, so the graphic display of it includes um, what you would call on image content, including the name, the logo, etc. cetera. Um, we have the elements of on image uh, to present. Um, and then you also have obviously off image, and that would include comments and responses to comments. It would include the description uh, of the image or the video as you're uploading it. And obviously you can be very creative in terms of your copy uh, in the, uh, the description. And then you've got what you would call your account level uh, aspects or details, who you are on Instagram. And that would include your profile picture, your profile name, your account description and your account URL. So as marketers, small business people, we've got an opportunity to weave these things together to present ourselves effectively uh, on Instagram and present our brand and our products on Instagram. You can go ahead to the next slide. So if you're not familiar with Instagram at all as a platform, then just real quickly, you've got um, images and video, 15 second video to work with. Um, so you can upload pictures. Obviously, as the, dis the example shows here, you can upload pictures that have been, uh, you know, treated graphically, um, or you can just take a picture straight through the app uh, and upload it. Uh, next slide. And then you've also got, um, you know, two ways in which the um, the content can be uh, consumed. One is over the apps. Um, I believe it was April 12th last year that. Instagram rolled out its app for Android, and in the first day it was downloaded over a million times. Um, and so the original app was for the iPhone platform, and, and uh, they have Android platform as well now. But, and then they also have released a web version, so any Instagram account can be viewed over the web. Uh, so let's roll through uh, a set of 10 monetization strategies. This is how um, we've researched in the book how effective marketers are using and we've used several of these for our own business as well and I'll camp on a few of these but let me just run through them real quickly the first one go ahead to the next slide is classic display ad work and I joke with people and say you know your your display ad guy you fired 10 years ago when you built out your social media team you better go back and and uh, you know hire him again and learn the lessons of classic display ad um, you can go to the next slide Laura um, and in these examples, you can see Audi, for example, um, is doing a very effective job. Uh, last time I looked, they had about 500,000 uh, followers on Instagram. You can see this image is just classic. This could be print or outplay ad work, um, but Instagram gives you a, a perfect channel uh, for it. And um, so they've got a nice copy on the top. They've got an effective image that's engaging. And you can't see it, but this... Uh, this image, I believe, after a week of being out in the public, it was liked over 17,000 times. So, you know, Audi's using it effectively. Go ahead to the next slide. It's another Audi example. Uh, the copy on this one you can't read, but it's hilarious. The copy is almost like techno uh, automotive Greek. I, I don't know. It's about their engines. But you clearly can see they're positioning themselves in terms of their copy to really, really resonate with their core audience. And in fact, they're announcing a new engine that's going to be coming out for their cars uh, in that uh, block of copy. 
And so they're using um, Instagram very effectively as sort of a classic display ad look. Go ahead to the next slide. And you can see that another way Instagram's being used is as giveaways. Uh, or it's used to uh, as a platform uh, to do giveaways. And you might have noticed that in the World Series, uh, MasterCard did a very effective stand up to cancer campaign. Uh, they had a nice uh, moment at the World Series where they, you know, kind of uh, focused on that. And then on Instagram, they had uh, a similar, you know, kind of presentation of the, the call to action. The, uh, the graphic was effective and the call to action was basically, you know, uh, use your MasterCard and we'll give money to stand up to cancer. So it was asking you to participate in a giveaway by, of course, the use of your, uh, your MasterCard. Go ahead to the next slide. You can see another example is Forever 21. They're doing a more traditional giveaway where they've got a nice graphic that has a calendar um, and they're doing a giveaway a day. Um, and it's engaged through Instagram um, and they've got the rules and requirements to participate that they show. Um, gives a unique opportunity for uh, their fans and followers to engage with the brand. Go ahead to the next slide. The third thing you can do is special offers. So, um, you know, the opportunity to do the buy one, get one, or free shipping, those types of special op offers are uh, being done all over Instagram right now. It's a very effective tool. Um, it also allows you to test the direct response metrics associated with your Instagram work. So, you know, if you want to test the efficacy of Instagram, then, you know, create a special offer, only put it out through the Instagram channel, and you'll see immediately whether you're getting traction in it um, on the platform. Um, go ahead to the next slide. Burger King did this recently when they did this Satis Fries campaign, which, of course, are French fries that look exactly like uh, Dairy Queen's French fries, which I love, so they'll probably be great. You can tell I like food. Um, and so they did this campaign. It was free fries. They put it out on Instagram. And the description is pretty nice copy. It says, you know, um, and I won't read it verbatim, but basically, you know, resist the urge to pull out your wallet, walk up to the counter, and ask for free satis fries. Um, and so that's their kind of unique rollout of, uh, of this, um, you know, special off for their new product launch. So go ahead to the next, um, the next slide. The, the next thing you can do is, is contests. Uh, this is an example from ModCloth. If you're not familiar with who they are, they're a very effective uh, e-tailer out of San Francisco. And uh, so they're constantly doing contests. Um, and the opportunity to do contests on Instagram um, is, first of all, within the terms of service, as I've read them lately, uh, they still allow us as marketers to do uh, contests. And uh, so, People have wondered, I wondered, when Instagram was purchased by Facebook, would uh, tighten that up or not. But it's still a platform that's allowing contests effectively. And uh, marketers are using it as an engagement tool really well. Go ahead to the next slide. You'll see that Ben & Jerry's did a contest uh, on Instagram that was pretty widely covered. It's pretty creative use of the platform. They, uh, they asked people to use a hashtag, uh, Capture Euphoria, as they took pictures of their uh, you know, ice cream experience, and then they offered the winner the chance to be uh, a star, sort of, in the regional print and outdoor campaign. So Megan won, and she was made a star uh, regionally through their outdoor campaigns um, and included in their work in that way. And uh, so it was widely considered an effective contest, an effective use of hashtags for contests on Instagram. Go ahead to the next slide. The fifth way you can monetize is by um, advertising info products. Um, this is an example from Cisco. Uh, they've done an effective job creating a, a comprehensive survey, and then they did very nice graphic presentations of some of the data and put it out on Instagram. And of course, the call to action is to you know go to uh, their site, download the full survey, and you know begin the engagement process. So there you uh, is a pure you know, content presentation to drive traffic to the website. Um, you can go to the next slide. Liberty Jane Clothing, this is an example of one of our uh, uh, doll outfits. It's a, a pattern guidebook that we publish. And uh, we've had about 300,000 of these downloaded from our e-commerce site. Um, and so we use Instagram to offer these free patterns uh, through our website. And so it's a call to action for people to come 
to our website, pick up a, a couple free patterns, um, and it's a classic, you know, sort of um, ethical bribe, you could call it, as a marketer. Go ahead to the next slide. The, uh, the sixth way you can um, use Instagram to monetize, uh, next slide, is a classic, what you might call two-step lead generation process. Um, the, uh, something's happening to our slides. I'll mention this as we go. Um, the uh, examples you can use for two-step lead generation process are really kind of fascinating. I think the, the main idea here, there we are, is that um, when you're collecting followers, obviously this is true in any social platform, uh, you have the opportunity to remarket to them over time. Uh, this is an example of ModClock, Instagram followers, hey, go and, and pick up a copy of the New York Times and look at our uh, article all about our company. Uh, you can go to the next slide. Um, another example of this that's even more creative is um, um, Dakota Mechanic Studios. This guy upcycles old DC-3 airplane parts. And so he started using, this is the guy I mentioned that said Instagram's working better than Pinterest. He started putting pictures of airplanes on Instagram and using a hashtags effectively like aviation, AV geek, warbirds, and all the hashtags that would be associated with uh, aviation industry. Uh, and and he, he takes a twice a day of airplanes because uh, he works at, a, at an airport. And then, of course, when he releases his product, and this is an example of an old uh, uh, engine part turned into a clock, uh, he's got a ready audience, right? So that's classic two-step lead gen, and it really ties perfectly in with what um, Joe was talking about previously in terms of content strategy, where you want to position um, content uh, and information effectively, and then couple that with your opportunity for product sale. Um, go ahead to the next slide. So the seventh way you can um, use Instagram for monetization is through product launch strategy. And we've used this at Liberty Jane Clothing effectively. We love this strategy. It works very well for us. Um, you can see in this example, Taco Bell's using it. Um, the idea is simple, right? So the, uh, the traditional uh, marketer's uh, use of the old uh, ADA model, um, capturing attention and interest and then um, engaging people, really got brought into kind of the internet space uh, with email product launches where over time content would be released and talked about through email. And then Jeff Walker is probably the internet marker that kind of revolutionized this space in terms of product launches. Well, Instagram came along and everybody immediately realized it's a perfect platform for uh, the visual product launch. And in fact, now that Instagram has 15 second videos, you could of course do video product launches on Instagram as well. The basic idea is that you bring people into the sales cycle very, very early. And do this for our company, Liberty and Clothing. Uh, my wife as a designer will, you know, focus on design concepts. She'll include people visually in what she's thinking about designing. And then through the fabrication process, creation process, pictures are taken, um, and energy and enthusiasm is built up and built up uh, as a product comes to market. Um, and then, of course, a few days before it's ready to be listed, you know, there's uh, more images that are shared. And, um, and then finally, you know, the day of, uh, the product is available for purchase. And what you find is a groundswell of consumer support and interest and buy-in. And it really is an effective way to launch products. You can go to the next slide. Um, and uh, you can see that it's not just little e-commerce companies like Liberty Jane Clothing doing this or, or even Taco Bell. But here's an example from BMW. Uh, you can't see the description, but uh, in description for this photo, it says uh, the, the uh, first ever uh, BMW 3 Series convertible is coming soon, something to that effect. Um, and so they're using Instagram as a platform to sort of tease their fan base and uh, release pictures of um, you know, con uh, you know, sales opportunities that are coming up in the future. So go ahead to the next slide. Um, you can see that another way to monetize for local retailers with Instagram is through photo walks. Um, if you're a local retailer and you're wondering, well, how do I do Instagram to engage? Uh, here. The first one, this photo walk idea is very effective. And companies are doing it all over the place uh, where they're offering to meet up 
and actually meet people face to face and say, hey, how are you? My name is Jason. And uh, then take them on a tour. And obviously this works better if you're in San Francisco or, you know, someplace cool. It wouldn't work in the back of nowhere. Um, but in, uh, you know, an urban setting, metropolitan area, it would work pretty well. And the idea is you take people on a walk of your neighborhood or city, allow them to take pictures and push them to their Instagram accounts. Uh, and in that way, you bond with people who are interested in your uh, niche industry or topic. Go to the next slide and you'll see that uh, Charity Water recently did this where they did their Insta walk across the Brooklyn Bridge, uh, which is a creative idea and a creative way to engage with donors in a charity context uh, in a local space. So go ahead to the next slide and you'll see that there's a, a, a nice use of hashtags as the ninth way to monetize. And that is uh, this uh, example, the restaurant from New York called Komodo. It's been widely covered. Um, it's using hashtags in a novel way. They, uh, they put a hashtag on every menu item. And then if it's down for the restaurant, they pull up on Instagram that hashtag, see what other uh, buyers purchased previously and, and their presentation of that menu item and then decide whether they want to buy that uh, item or not. And then, of course, what do they do when they get that plate of food set down in front of them? They repeat the process and take an image of the food. Hey, I'm at Komodo. Here's the, you know, the item on the menu. Um, and, of course, that goes to all of their friends and followers on their own Instagram account. So it's a neat way to share content virally in a, a local context. Uh, go ahead to the next slide and you'll see just another plate of um, uh, I haven't seen other examples of companies doing this, but it's, it's a pretty interesting use. So the last way, if you go to the next slide, of using Instagram to monetize is just physically turn your images into product. And this would work well for some brands versus others. Uh, if you've got a strong logo brand concept and you have followers that would be interested in that, you can literally turn your images into everything, of course, and there are lots of sites that will help you uh, do that type of thing. Um, and uh, I mentioned a couple here. I think Artfire is one that does well. And then if you go to the next slide, uh, Stickygram is one that does well. Um, you can turn your Instagram images into magnets and stickers and that kind of thing. So you've got an opportunity there. If you want tchotchkes or you know, product related to your brand, it's very, very straightforward and seamless. Um, so those are 10 monetization strategies related to Instagram. Um, obviously, in the book, Instagram Power, we dive into to those very deeply and, and talk a lot more about other effective uses. Um, the number one thing I'd leave you with, and then we can jump into Q&A, is you've got to decide right from the beginning uh, about your editorial mission. And obviously, as a, a retailer with a physical product like at Liberty Jane Clothing, that's easier to do than it is, for example, as an author, uh, where I have to say, well, what would my followers want to see on Instagram? So it'll work for some uh, companies better than others. Obviously, for B2C companies, it's very, very effective, generally. Um, and uh, if it's an opportunity, I would highly recommend you jump into it, if for no other reason than to learn how to do mobile marketing and really get your bearings about how people are consuming content on mobile devices. Uh, last slide. So it, I've got a free ebook available. Feel free to grab a copy. Uh, it's a, a real deep dive on doing visual product launches on Instagram. So you can grab a copy at instagrampower.com. And feel free to follow me on both Instagram and Twitter at Mr. Jason Miles. And hopefully we have time for Q&A. Thanks so much. Q&A. Um, the first question is, do you have a concise list of rules for how to develop a good mission statement and or what constitutes a good mission statement? I'm just going to bring back Joe. Uh, All right. Hey, great job, Jason. That was fantastic. Yes, sir. Mr. Jason Miles. <laughs> uh, okay, so the question, thanks, Laura. Um, Probably the easiest thing to do when you talk, I mean, it's it's actually funny that Jason, you talked about, you know, your editorial mission statement, my content, we didn't even practice this, but it, it's funny, we've got the same thing, you've got to start with an idea of what's going to drive the entire content plan, 
So the question here is, you know, what makes a good mission statement? Um, easiest thing to do, if you go to epiccontentmarketing.com, I actually have a free chapter. So there's a free chapter available. Of course, I'd love to buy, buy the book, but get this for free. It'll go through the whole thing. One really quick strategy that I like that I stole from Marcus Sheridan. Marcus is the CEO of River Pools and Spas. He's got a great content marketing story that we cover in the book. He basically sat down and he writes out every question that his customers ask him. Every day, writes down that question. And what it'll start to do, is you'll start to think of, well, where, you know, how should I position my content, as Jason was talking about? Where can we really be a true resource for our customers? And then once you get that done, then you can start to get to which channels work, like Jason was saying. Is it Instagram? Is it Pinterest? You know, what, is, it, is, it, is it a blog? What sort of is the center of gravity for your content? Most people fail when they go to that first thing. Like, oh, Facebook. What are we going to do on Facebook? Well, don't do that. Or if you've done it, just take a step back first and, and do what Jason's telling you. Take a step back, figure out what that content mission is going to be for your organization, and then you can figure out what the channels are second to that. Jason, I don't know if you have a take on that question. Yeah, no, I think you're exactly right. That's perfect. All right. Laura, do you got another question for us? What are your thoughts on using multiple social media channels to promote a product or launch a campaign in terms of how to change the content for each platform or decide which platforms to use? And just let me bring back Jason. Okay. Yeah, Jason, as you're coming back in, um, I can probably start to ask a little, answer a little bit of this. The, the, I think the first thing I would say, Jason, I want to get your take because you've got a really good take on, the, on Pinterest and Instagram and those other channels as well. I would um, go tentatively into using many, many channels when you look at it. And I think the best way to go is if you look at, look at the greatest media brands and the greatest brands out there using content, they really want one or two channels really, really well. That's because they're are on those channels but also because they have a proficiency and their content that they have is sort of fit for that so yours could be you know maybe your your blog is your center of gravity maybe it's white papers maybe it's ebooks that you share on slideshare maybe it's images that you share on instagram i would focus on one first the great media brands of all time have all started with one channel and then they work off of that um, Laura, you're totally right that you've got to make sure that every one of your stories that you're telling on these channels are different I mean, the days of Ping FM are gone when you create one statement and it goes to 50 social media sites. That We've learned that's the way to do it. If you want a conversation with your customers, you've got to create your own little uh, independent stories in each one of those channels. So my take is, Jason, I don't know what your take is. My take is focus on one or two that you can do really well instead of doing 10 mediocre. No, I totally agree 100%. And I would say there is one that every marketer should do. Uh, before anything else, and that's email marketing. Some people don't consider that social media marketing. I say email marketing is the original and best online marketing. Um, and then choose your platform based on your customer uh, demographics and their engagement. You know, for us, Pinterest immediately popped. Uh, others, it hasn't. Um, but I'm a huge believer in not engaging on a platform unless you're really committed to it um, and really focus on scaling it. It's a, it's a social error to be on platforms with a half dozen, you know, followers or subscribers. Um, you're doing damage to your brand, in my view, you know, and the hardest one for companies to really uh, get right, at, in my view, is YouTube. You see so many huge companies with 100 subscribers on their YouTube channel. And so my next book is about YouTube marketing. Um, and that's how we started was on YouTube. And I think in some ways the toughest nut to crack. But the number one thing would be um, where are your customers and can you engage with them effectively on that platform? And for us, for example, we knew Twitter was not the play for us. We never engaged with Twitter for our company. It just wasn't right for us. Not only didn't we think it wasn't right for our customers, uh, as an engagement tool, but we personally weren't willing to engage well, you know, kind of on those terms and use Twitter how it really needs to be used, which is constant engagement. Um, and so for us, for Liberty Jean Clothing, we said Twitter is not going to be one of the platforms that we're on and we care less of what people say about the uh, efficacy of the platform. 
we know what we're doing on the platforms we're on and we're we're uh, upbeat and positive about the platforms we're on and not all of them will be right for us and we're fine with that you know because the day of being on every platform i think as they continue to grow and scale as we've seen with pinterest and instagram coming along there will be more platforms you know snapchat is coming up so fast so you have to pick and choose and uh, decide what's right for you and your customers you know to to that point just to follow up and, and i think we probably have time for one more question jason is you cannot say the point about email marketing uh, yeah. at the end of the day if you and, and by the way consistency right it, i mean you've talked about it if you're going to pick any one of these channels do it consistently most brands that fail with content marketing or content creation and distribution in some way they do it inconsistently or they start and stop you're going to create a long-term relationship with your customers unless you do it consistently and get and that. So you mentioned that, Jason. But when you get people to come back to your site, you have to get them to sign up for something because at the end of the day, you don't own your Pinterest exactly. followers, your Instagram followers, your Facebook followers, your Twitter followers. You don't own any of that. Yep. Twitter tomorrow could say, ah, sorry, all those connections, we have them now. You're done. But if with yep. email, you can act as it is something right now that you can own a database and it's very very valuable and you can do a lot of things with it so uh, an email newsletter is probably something that every company should look at or some ongoing consistent uh, sending of information out through email and then Laura I don't know if we have do we have time for one more question let's do one more if we ha if we can of you are advocating email marketing um, why don't we just end with you know your top one or two tips for creating a great email marketing campaign um, and let me bring back Joe and I'll go while he's coming back up so my one or two tips would look like this um, commit yourself to it first of all start to learn about it obviously there are tons of great ebooks out there I've got a entry kind of level ebook about it everybody does um, and obviously tons of the you know providers do as well um, and so when we really move the needle I mean, it was 18 months into our little company's life before we realized email marketing was important. And I remember looking at our a list and we had 125 names on the email list. And we were like, oh, this is horrible. But everybody starts there, somewhere like that. And so you have to just make the commitment. Having a really effective ethical bribe for your prospects uh, is probably the single most important part of converting people from a viewer of your content to adding their name to your list. And ethical bribes, ebooks are great for that, white papers, uh, free video courses. It really depends on your audience what might work best. Um, but you know, the commitment to it, uh, the placement of an ethical bribe, and then monitoring what works. And then finally, I would say, the commitment to actually send the emails. All of us have probably built email lists that we've been bad at emailing, and I've done that as my, uh, you know, myself. Um, so for our business, we developed the habit of a Friday newsletter, and then we'll do intermittent, you know, emails at different times in different ways. But that commitment to a newsletter every Friday um, for us has really helped solidify our use of email marketing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. No, those are great points, Jason, and. Yeah, I, I would. I, I think you, those are great points. I love the ethical bribe. You have to have something at the end for them to sign up to. Uh, yeah. I would say that the number one thing based on it, and then we'll close it out, is set it. Set it, and I think you're saying this, Jason, but set an editorial calendar. Actually, and you, mm -hmm. there's lots of great tools out there. If you don't want to spend any money, then you could just use an Excel spreadsheet. Um, what are you doing on your blog every day or every week and you're doing it the consistent time every day and every week same thing with e-newsletter you know we do we have daily e-newsletters as well as a weekly e-newsletter there's a lot of time and effort that go into that but start out something you can do maybe it's uh, every two weeks and you start there I would always say if you're gonna do it, start infrequent to frequent so don't go daily and then say oh I can't do it then go weekly start out with monthly and then come back in and work it in with you with what you can and you're you're only going to start out with 10 or or 50 or 100 subscribers uh, but then look at the calls to action on everything you do so if you have blog content have a call to action with your 
ebook or something really valuable, and then they also get your e-newsletter. Uh, put it on your business card if you want to. Send it out through some of those great strategies that Jason talked about to get people to sign up. Um, start to look at maybe taking down other calls to action so that you can get more people signed up to your email newsletter. And critical, and then use one of those really good email services out there. Uh, don't send it out through Gmail or if you're a small business, some right. people still send it out through their email. Don't do that. Use a legitimate email service uh, that that can get you whitelisted and, and all kinds of good stuff. So I would I would leave it with that. And then the last thing I would say is, uh, Jason's got you know, two fantastic books, uh, Pinterest Power and Instagram Power. And I'm, I didn't even know you were writing YouTube Power, so I'm looking forward to it, man. That's awesome. So pick up his yeah, books. Thank you. And Laura, that's it for me. Thanks so much. This was a great webinar, and we'll be sure to send out the slides in the broadcast, so stay tuned for that. Um, and don't forget to pick up your copy of Epic Content Marketing and Instagram Power. Thanks, everybody. See you next time.